Welcome, Ilva. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I'm Ilva Tingström, as uh, Magnus just said. And it's really exciting to be here to talk about AI and uh, how to uh, get to the scaling part. Uh, this, the, um, the focus here will be the think big, start small and scale fast. And that's a quote that you might have heard, you know, related to uh, uh, innovation or other things. Uh, but it's also applicable when it comes to AI. And just to be really clear here, I will not talk today about, you know, general artificial intelligence or like um, organizations that are totally based on AI algorithms. Uh, but I will more talk about the challenges and some solutions that we've seen uh, in more ordinary uh, organizations and, and uh, companies that would like to get uh, AI and ML to use in their operations and to get value from that. So let's see. Uh, this is an, uh, quite an old picture. It's actually just a couple of years old. Uh, but what we saw then is that a uh, lot of organizations are struggling to get from the exploration phase to large scale development. And what happened in between there was that many like POCs or uh, pr proof of concepts or pilots were stuck in what we could call AI Death Valley. It's like, well, we try something out and we, we can't get it further. We can't get into production and we can't therefore get any value from that. So what we talked about a lot then was to, to bridge that AI, AI Death Valley or POC graveyard that many of them talked about uh, to get from the exploration and into deployment faster. Uh, now, as I said to the other guys here, I would love to have a whiteboard to do this without PowerPoint. But now getting into 2021, what we see now is that, okay, so many people or organizations has, have come to the deployment phase. They've started to get value but it get, it's very cumbersome. And also uh, what we saw last year with the pandemic and everything changes in the market is that we need to be uh, much faster doing this. And also uh, maybe do a lot of more stuff in a more intelligent way. So the standard to what we want to reach, I mean, not uh, after two. 2030, but even even uh, earlier than that is much higher than we might start it out. So what we need to do is to get this uh, curve steeper and to get uh, things uh, to the value stage uh, much faster. But what's the problem then with that? <laughs> well, there are a lot of issues, of course, we've all thought about, you know, the ethics around AI, what can be done, what should be done, you know, how to prioritize, etc. Um, but it's the fact now that many organizations have tried out AI and they might sort of brag a little bit about that in seminars and so on. But to getting to the real opera uh, opera <laughs> to the real um, uh, big scale uh, um, phase is really difficult. Um, so when I graduated from KTH 20 years ago, it was like a hush hush thing to talk about that I specialized in mathematical statistics. And from then to now, uh, the hype around, you know, data science and AI and mathematical algorithms that we use is super high. And to some extent, data scientists are considered being some sort of a unicorn. Not only should they be very good at you know, solving the actual uh, mathematical problems, but they should also take into account the, maybe the user experience. They should also take into account the data uh, that they use and how it's stored or even you know, archived and things like that. Um, so. So what I will bring up today is some sort of uh, perspectives from the data scientist or analytics point of view 
that might, if you are not familiar with this or in this community yourself, um, might help you understand the, the things that we're facing. And my, my opinion is that we need to do this together. So let's kick out with the first topic. So the, if I say the number 42, maybe some of you uh, think, <laughs> I see someone here, uh, think about something very familiar. That is the answer to the question of life, universe and everything, uh, according to uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it was also calculated by a supercomputer for a very long time. <laughs> and uh, the problem with that answer is that we don't know the real question, right? Um, so, you know, when I took the specialization in, in statistics, well, I thought there's data everywhere. You can use these uh, te techniques everywhere. And that has been proven true. I've worked in, in many different contexts and industries and so on. And still the answers or the questions uh, come from the business. So they come maybe from uh, chemists or uh, even people sending out emails in marketing automations and so on. And I bring my expertise around the data and what to, to bring out from the data and answer with these questions. Um, so the true value from AIML comes actually from asking the right questions. And I want to bring up a short story about uh, one of our largest uh, clients. Uh, it's Unilever. And they have an absolutely fascinating um, uh, sort of platform and, and process and ways of working called People Data Center. And I will link uh, to a webinar that you can see more about that. Um, not only do they have uh, a platform, they have uh, unified data that everyone can reach. They also have a large organization all over the world with uh, data scientists and analysts helping out the business in the different markets. Um, but what I want to bring up here is not only uh, the, the sort of the platform, the organization and things like that, but this very bold statement was, was quite early said by the PDC. So we have the answer, but what is your question? So um, the thing with how this works is that every question that comes into the PDC organization, that the, the people helping out and serving the business, is actually co-created with business. So never is it allowed to just send in a question and uh, get, uh, wait for a response. So the, the thing that this does is that both perspectives are always taken, the business perspective and the data and analytics perspective. So the, the business person uh, that maybe doesn't know at all uh, what data is available, the millions of millions of tweets and sentiments and, and other, other type of data, and also the prepackaged uh, AI solution that could be used for their case. That is what can be presented by, uh, by the analyst back and the question can be refined. The next thing uh, here is that it's also mandatory to prepare a really good presentation of the results so that it's easily understandable by the people that make the decisions. And um, I think that's a part that sometimes is missing and makes it really easy to go uh, um, and, and at Unilever, it makes it really easy to go from the actual result, the actual answer to the question, and what should be done. Well, um, the next thing we talked about um, also here in the little group before we started is that what differs from maybe other type of development is that when you're going to create an AI ML solution, you cannot, I, I say it again, yeah, you cannot uh, use test data only. You can't make uh, any sense from having Calculing or Kalanka uh, in your model. Uh, so how to do this? Because uh, what we all see is that 
uh, not only regulations have been uh, made tighter, but that's also, of course, for, to protect us, you know, individuals, and that our personal data is private and, and kept safe. Um, so I think that is a, a question that really comes up maybe as a, not a surprise, but maybe an, how should a uh, unpleasant uh, s um, finding after a while when you tr started doing, uh, started modeling, that you actually need to take care of this outside of your modeling. And many, organizations we work with uh, are in the public sector and there they a lot of precautions around you know not having data in the cloud but even if you have uh, the possibility to have data in the cloud you be, need to be really really cautious about how to protect that um, and sometimes that's that's not considered during development and you find a really good model and, and then when you're going into production, then these sort of questions start arising and, and also becomes really relevant. So, um, as I said, everyone has sensitive data, uh, but not everyone has a possibility to, to take care of them in a good way. And I am going to be really honest, this is not my, my expertise area, but I see it more and more being a super relevant and important area for everyone that wants to do things in, in this space. And uh, we've, uh, we've been uh, uh, talking to municipalities and, um, uh, and also hospitals a lot in Norway, and our experts in this area with data trust and security are working very closely with them to come up with solutions, not only that is a te technical platform, but also processes on how and when to pseudonymize or uh, uh, divide data into different uh, um, zones, etc., just to keep uh, uh, the personal data really super protected. And um, and make sure to involve people that uh, handle the data and have uh, data governance and processes around that early on, so you can't, uh, so you so you don't so you can uh, uh, can uh, get past this uh, step in a in a, in a trusted and safe way, because it's really important, of course, when you put your data mo or your models, AML models, into production that the results also can be trusted. And that is, uh, of course, the end users uh, can trust that the, their data is safe. So the last one I call design for industrialization. And now that I read it, it's much easier. <laughs> OK, so let's get to the last part. OK, and that is when when you work as a scientist, it's, you can hear it by the name, it's very explorative and you try out different uh, methodologies, you find out the best uh, possible uh, model for your data uh, and you also have focus on, um, on how to, to fine tune your models and make them production uh, ready. And then what happens? Then you have to sort of uh, make this happen in reality. And of course, I, I understand that a lot of you that are here are developers of different types. And for you, it might be like piece of cake, you know, having something in a message queue, telling something else to run and then fetching a data here and uh, putting it somewhere else uh, using the model. But for many of the data scientists, this is not business as usual. Um, so I would like also here to give you an example on uh, how one of our clients, you know, really struggled in this area and how they got further with this. So I want to talk to, to you about EL Shop. And uh, EL Shop uh, uh, had a um, really good uh, 
I, I would say a good organization, a lot of data, very good quality. Uh, also uh, a, a huge uh, portion of uh, data engineers serving data to a small data science team. And they uh, were a mix of, of employees and, and some consultants and they made uh, some models that were very good for, for example, predicting, you know, um, uh, suggesting uh, accessories when you when you buy on their uh, website or even helping out you know when they had a new product coming in to um, automatically fit it into the product hierarchy in their system that needed that was needed um, but the problem was you know there were several different people working with these uh, codes and it was all, all notebook uh, um, um, organized and everyone did a little bit like uh, they wanted and um, it was really difficult whenever a uh, um, piece of code or a model was in production to uh, to find out what was wrong for example if something went wrong it, it does sometimes <laughs> then it was really uh, cumbersome for the people there to understand what was actually the problem and in what uh, part of the code and uh, you know was it something with a network was it something else so they spent i would say around 80 80 percent of their time doing sort of maintenance of the already uh, um, uh, uh, the, the models that were already in production and of course just 20 percent on new exciting development um, so the thing that we uh, helped Elchap with was that one of our uh, consultants that uh, was in this data science team together of course with other guys uh, set up the new ways of working together and this is probably really like mainstream stuff for every, I mean, original developer, you know, being good uh, with, uh, with, uh, um, with your code and also doing it in, in smaller pieces and also uh, making sure that someone uh, peer reviewed it. Very simple steps for many of you, but sometimes not as usual uh, when you work with these kind of things. Um, and they also looked into having a new type of platform that was uh, easier to use an MLOps um, process with. So there were several different steps, but I would say that the ways of working was really the most important thing. And here is where I think. Um, like uh, uh, regular developers and uh, data scientists should work together and find the best ways of working to get it really, I mean, um, low maintenance uh, applications. So what happened after this a little bit cumbersome process, of course, they, I think it took uh, them half a year or something to, to redo these things in, in a good way. Uh, but then what you can see to the right is that, okay, so now the maintenance was down to 10% and the new exciting things you can do, of course, could be the major part. So, and here are some of the components that were important. So the ways of working, uh, the platform, of course, and, and data, and the MLOps opportunities, also organization, and and of course the laws and ethics involved okay so a little bit back to where we started um i mean it's of course really important with having you know high goals of what you want to do uh having interesting and and, and um valuable uh use cases think big right you need to start small. I, I think we should. Uh, we were going to talk about that later, also with the, this uh, master thesis, uh, for example. But what I want to emphasize here is this scale fast, and that there are several components there, 
uh, where you cannot uh, rely on your data scientists only. That we need to be involved from several parts of the organization and work together. And that is to be able to design for industrialization. So that was my last step. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for letting me be here. And um, also uh, saying that uh, if you need help with this, we are about a thousand people in Capgemini uh, Insights and Data in the Nordics that uh, can help you out. So get in touch. But also, if you want to help, uh, we need more experts in this area. So get in touch <laughs> and let, this ma uh, ma let us make this happen together. Thank you. Thank you, Ulva. And mm? Thanks for coming. Very nice presentation. Please, please stay. I want to actually oh. ask you a oh, question. Okay. I haven't received any question, but <laughs> I, I have one. My, my, this is my own curiosity. How yeah. come you went into math? Oh, you pursued a degree in math. It's like very uncommon. <sighs> yes, actually. So in in my in my uh, grade in at KTH of uh, physical uh, physics engineering, uh, then it was only me actually choosing mm -hmm. uh, the mathematical statistics uh, specialization. And uh, one, I had some sort of um, uh, sense of probabilities that not everyone had. I like that. And also that it's not like, so math is maths, but statistics and, and, and this is more not black and white. It's more, you know, well, everything is uncertain. So let's check how uncertain it is. Mm. I really like that idea. So it's a little bit philosophical as well. Mm. And then the last thing that I also mentioned is that, you know, data is everywhere. So you can do a lot of interesting stuff uh, when you know uh, how to 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 analyze data mm. and that has been proven through as well yeah. thank you for yeah asking. thank you <laughs> thank you for coming again big okay. thanks to Ilva. thank you bye